Our story this morning is adapted from a UUA curriculum and is called Hosea Ballou and the Muddy Children. Over 200 years ago, there lived a small boy named Hosea Ballou. Hosea, just like other children, liked to learn new things and do new things. He was always asking questions about what and why and how. And just like other children, Hosea liked to play hide and seek or word games or make believe. And Hosea, just like other children, also loved mud. He liked to jump in puddles hard with both feet and make the muddy water splash really high so that the mud splattered all over his brothers and sisters' clothes. And he loved to step in puddles very slowly so that the mud oozed up just a little bit at a time between his toes. He loved to make mud pies and mud snowmen and anything you could think of to do with mud. Hosea loved mud. Now you can imagine that not everybody in his family liked mud quite as much as Hosea did. His mother had died when he was not quite two, and so his older sisters took care of him. His older sister who did laundry and scrubbed the family's dirty clothes in big wash tubs did not like having to scrub all that mud off of Hosea's clothes and off of everybody else's clothes when he splashed them. Another older sister who kept the little children clean didn't like having to scrub all that mud off of Hosea. And Hosea, just like many other children, did not really like having baths either, especially when it meant he had to stand in a wash tub in front of the fire and have water dumped over his head and all that good mud just go down into the water. But his sisters loved him, so they took him home and washed him and dried him and made him clean every time. Then Hosea's sisters went to their father and said, Father, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. We're doing so much laundry. <laughs> Hosea, said his father very sternly, you should not play in the mud. Why, asked Hosea, because just like other children, asking questions was another thing he loved to do. Because, said his father, who was one of the preachers in the Baptist church the family went to, just as we try to live a good life, to be kind to other people and to follow God's plan, we also try to stay clean. Yes, father, Hosea said, and after that day he did indeed try to stay clean. But it wasn't easy. He stopped stomping in the mud puddles on purpose and splashing through the muddy water everywhere, but sometimes the mud was just there. Then he had to walk through the mud to get across the yard to gather the eggs from the chickens. He had to walk in the mud to feed the pigs. And sometimes when he was already muddy from doing his chores, he would play in the mud just a little bit and get even muddier. His sisters, who loved him very much, took him home and washed him and dried him and made him all clean. But Hosea's sisters went to their father again and said, Father, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. Hosea, said his father even more sternly this time, you must not play in the mud. Yes, father, Hosea said. He was sad because he had truly tried not to get muddy, most of the time anyway. Are you really angry with me, father? I am disappointed in you, Hosea, and I am a little angry with you. Hosea hung his head and kicked at the dirt with his toes. Then he dared to look up just a little to ask, do you still love me? Hosea, said his father, and he didn't sound stern anymore. I will always love you, no matter what you do. Even if I get muddy again? Yes, Hosea. Even if I get really, really muddy? Yes, Hosea. Even if I get mud all the way up to my eyebrows and between my fingers and my toes and in my hair? Even then, his father said with a smile. Then he added, very stern again, but remember, Hosea, you must try to stay clean. I'll remember, and, and I really will try. Hosea promised, and he did. He stayed clean most of the time anyway. And as he grew up, 
he stopped liking muds quite so much, but he still liked to ask questions about what and how and why. Father, Hosea asked when he was a teenager, how can it be that our church believes that God will only let one in a thousand people into heaven, even if many of those thousand people lead good lives? His father's Baptist answer didn't really satisfy Hosea. Father, Hosea asked, if, if I had the power to create a living creature, and if I knew that the creature would have a miserable life, would suffer and die, and then go to H-E double hockey sticks and be miserable forever, and I went ahead and created this creature anyway, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? And would I be good or bad? The story as it's written says his father didn't have an answer for that question. I would guess that the Baptist preacher did have an answer, but the writer of the story didn't like it. So there's no <laughs> response from the father. But essentially, Hosea had to find his own answers. So he read the Bible, which is a book with many stories about religious people and about God. He went to some universalist churches near him and asked more questions there. At the age of 19, Hosea decided that he too believed in universal salvation, which is the idea that everyone, everywhere, everyone in the universe will be given salvation. Eventually, everyone will be saved from hell. And not only did Hosea believe that God would let more than a thousand people into heaven, Hosea Ballou believed that God would eventually let everyone into heaven, good and bad. How can you believe that? Asked his father. How can you believe that God would let bad people into heaven? Because, father, I remember what you told me when I was small. I believe that even if God is disappointed with people or a little angry with them, God will always love them and want them to be happy no matter what they do and no matter how muddy they get. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned, circle for release, circle for the planet, Circle for each soul, for the children of our children, keep the circle home. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned circle for release circle for the planet circle for each soul for the children of our children keep the circle home Thank you, Hannah. I'd like to preface this reflection by saying that you're, you've already heard me talk and you're going to hear me talk a lot about God and Christianity today. And since most of y'all haven't heard me preach before, I will note that that's pretty unusual. <laughs> but it's important to explore the way that our religious ancestors understood the world. And it's important to note that I'm neither discouraging nor encouraging anything about your relationship with God or gods or the universe or various religions. That's an important and wonderful thing about UUism is we can follow each of our own spiritual paths. Many UU congregations like to talk a lot about capital L love these days. And that originally, for the universalists at least, meant God's love. 
But now that God has come to mean something different to a lot of folks, what love are we talking about? Back in the day in Christian Europe, there was this idea that wealth supposedly signaled goodness and God's love. Poverty signaled that you must have done something wrong and that you'd probably be damned to hell. But poor people thought that didn't make any sense, especially since it was the wealthy who were the ones saying it all the time. And the wealthy merchants paid the priests and the priests blessed the kings and the kings protected the merchants and almost all of these were men. All of these powerful dudes agreed that they had the power because God must have chosen them and loved them and that must mean they were good. So if you weren't powerful, that must mean you were bad or stupid or weak and deserved what you got. And this was called theocracy. <laughs> You won't be surprised to hear that the poor, the ill, the orphaned, most women, and people who weren't ethnically European did not really resonate with this idea. The poor folks in particular started to think, what if wealth and poverty didn't have anything to do with God choosing to love and bless only a few people? What if God loved everyone? These folks thought, yeah, maybe life isn't fair, but after we die, we'll just all be included in heaven We'll all get to be with God together and we'll all have enough. That's called Christian universalism. And it made a lot of powerful people really mad because if you're not afraid of hell, how are they going to get you to behave? This is like our boy Hosea Ballou from earlier saying, Dad, will you love me even if I get muddy? I like that story a lot. I love telling that story, but I've also got to the point of realizing that there's something missing from the end of that story. Did anybody else notice? Hosea's sisters never get an apology. They never get a break from all that cleaning. Nobody makes it up to them. This Christian universalist idea that we'll all be included in heaven, even if you make a big muddy mess and make other people clean it up, a lot of women were not satisfied with that. A lot of people were not satisfied with that. So by now in our history, we're in early America, a couple hundred years ago, some universalists, including a lot of women, thought it's, kind of, it's not really fair if God included people in heaven, even if they had done really awful things. So some universalists thought maybe after death, there's a place called purgatory, kind of like afterlife detention, where people who had done bad things sort of sit for a while and think about what they did. They don't get punished right? They don't get damned to fire forever, but restored like a bath for your muddy soul. These folks thought God includes everyone in love and makes things fair in the afterlife. And they called that restoration universalism. Okay, so that's a bit more fair, right? The one teeny tiny problem is that all this fairness theoretically happens after you die. So who in early America might not be satisfied living their whole lives under the thumb of really cruel people in the harshest conditions imaginable, just hoping it all gets sorted out after we all kick the bucket? Yeah, folks who were enslaved did not love this idea. So now we're up to the last couple hundred years. Black folks in America had struggled for freedom and been emancipated, but things were still really rigged to be unfair towards them. Universalism, the idea that everyone is included, wasn't really catching on with them. It was nice, but it wasn't fair. Now, there is notable Black universalist history, such as Reverend Joseph Jordan and his daughter, Annie Willis. They created a universalist school for Black children in Virginia. The larger faith support of the Jordan school was, you guessed it, a little unfair. They kept trying the 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 Unitarian and Universalists kept trying to get them to change the school, or this is true, they tried to put a white guy from Boston in charge of it instead of Joseph Jordan of his own school, or they tried to pull funding for it. But even so, the Jordans kept it going for 70 years. But for most Black Americans, Universalism has never really caught on because it didn't address their lived reality. 
So in the mid 1900s, black and brown folks heard all this Christian talk about God and the afterlife and asked, aren't y'all forgetting somebody? In South America and in black America in the 1960s, Christians highlighted that God had squeezed God's self into a human named Jesus and that Jesus was born in a barn, dirt poor. Jesus hung out with foreigners and sex workers and lowly Roman bureaucrats that even his friends hated. Jesus was Jewish under the oppressive Roman Empire. Jesus was unjustly killed by that empire. In the Christian understanding, that was God experiencing all of that. So these folks, like the Peruvian priest Gustavo Gutierrez and the Black American theologian James Cohn, and many others, thought, okay, God may love everyone, but because of the example of Jesus, we know, we can guess, that God prioritizes those who are poor and imprisoned and displaced and in despair because God has felt all that and continues to feel every ounce of suffering that humanity does. To those folks, to those Christian liberationists, that's what it means that God loves us, that God is on the side of the oppressed. So we should all work to change things now in everyday life, not wait for heaven until no one is oppressed anymore. And that's called liberation theology. So that brings us to the present day. Today, Unitarian Universalists say that though our individual beliefs vary widely, together we side with love. That's why that's the name of our national social justice campaign. And that's similar to the liberation theologians. We affirm that every person from the privileged to the oppressed has worth and dignity. Everything from the harmed to the harmful is connected in the interdependent web of being. But Unitarian Universalists side with love, side with those who are oppressed and hurting to work for change until we are all free. The black feminist author, Bell Hooks tells us, there is no love without justice. Inclusion isn't enough. We need to work for restorative justice on earth. We need to pitch in and wash what we make muddy. That's love in action. I once saw a bronze statue of a figure shrouded in a blanket, asleep on a bench. His head was covered, but his bare feet stuck out. It looked like the statue of a homeless person, huddled uncomfortably under a blanket that was too small for him to snatch some sleep before some cop tells him he can't sleep there. If you looked close at the statue's feet, you could see two marks, two holes, evoking Jesus after the crucifixion. Now, I'm an atheist, and I've also worked with a lot of people experiencing homelessness. So even though that isn't my religion, this statue reminded me that the universe is part of each of us. That each of us is part of the universe, and so we are connected to each other in our suffering and in our joy. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tells us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and that the beloved community can't be built from the middle up. So love lives in the souls and bodies of people who are harmed or excluded. Love also lives in the souls of bodies and bodies of people who harm and exclude. Love lives in the souls and bodies of people who witness harm, but do nothing to change it. Each of us has been harmed and caused harm and ignored harm. Some only feel these pains occasionally. Some are only free from them occasionally. When someone causes harm or ignores harm or has to bury their heart to get through the pains of life, that separation requires that we cut our souls off from the connectedness of all life. That separation that illusion of separateness hurts on the deepest, most divine level in ourselves. Yet when we take actions that are aligned with love and justice, 
we remember who and what we truly are. Facets of the holy oneness. When we side with love, when we go beyond inclusion and work for justice, we remember that our liberation is bound up together and that we aren't free until we're all free. Let us feel honored and undaunted at the sacred, liberating, universalist work still to be done. May it be so.